following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. It's hot in Vietnam, often hotter than the Mojave Desert. The temperature rises to 120 degrees, and the humidity hovers around 85%. You collapse from heat exhaustion. Hours time. In the day's time. The troops carry six canteens of water, and a new man should take about ten salt tablets a day. South Vietnam, west of Chu Lai, about halfway to the Laotian border. That was farther west than the 101st Airborne Brigade had ever operated. The Viet Cong had controlled the area for 15 years. We were beginning a new combat operation. I was with Platoon Sergeant Lewis B. Larry. Born and raised in Mississippi, a high school dropout, he joined the Army 12 years ago. Often, the lives of up to 40 men are in his hands. Sergeant Larry is always keenly attuned to the mood of his men. He knows a recruit will be afraid his first time under fire. He told me, this is only normal for a man to be scared. But if we keep him back in the rear, of the squad until the first firefight or the second firefight. And then he's got confidence in his set that he can do just as well as the next man can. I try to make the guy feel like he's just with a bunch of guys who want to survive and they're going to have to work together. And after three or four missions, and, and he'll start to work with the people. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger to where that this guy's got more pride and more guts than the the 25 people like him in the States. report, the fact that Larry is a Negro is of paramount importance. To the officers and men he serves with, it's a matter of total irrelevance. Larry knows them well. Son Wilson joined the platoon sometime during August. After he got over the first rough steps or two, uh, he was okay. Son Wilson is a go-getter. Uh, he likes to move. He likes to move a little fast uh, at times. This one kid, uh, Arkansas. Well, I can tell right away when something's wrong with him. Because if he's not talking, something's bothering him. I will be moving out. Well, Jim Hawkins is fire team leader in the third squad. Hawkins, I know personally. I, uh, I don't know the way he talks and the way I talk. It just seems like we have something in common. 
Well, where I live now and uh, where Hawkins lives in Chicago uh, is just about Holland distance. Any questions on this? We picked up Lieutenant Wilkinson uh, as a forward observer for the company. And there's no telling when you're going to hit Charlie and actually need artillery, so he's going to have to be on his toes. He's not afraid of it. And he can bring that stuff in so doggone close and make your hair rise up on your head. I've only had the one platoon leader since I've been here, and that's Lieutenant Unger. Lieutenant Unger, he understands a basic problem of the individual, which is, I, uh, I think, is more important than uh, knowing all of this to know he'll listen to all the problems. Uh, this is 6. Roger, they should be in at about 03. As soon as they uh, join up with you, give me a call, let me know, and I'll have instructions for you. Outbreak 466, six, over. Captain Manarudis, he's the company commander. He's real sharp with words. And if you screw up, you can expect to be nailed by it. So how many packs do you have on that uh, ship didn't make it over? Have you made contact with second squad? Sir? You want to start tying in right in here? First squad. Have the whole first squad to come on down. Hawkins, the white boy from Chicago, had observed Larry's manner of commanding his men. Hawkins said, He doesn't just come up and tell you to do something that he wouldn't do himself. But he'll sort of ask you to do something where, uh, in a sense, he's asking you to do it and telling you to do it and making you want to do it. Arkansas is a southern white serving under a Negro. He's never up there jumping on to you because you've done something wrong. He'll tell you what you've done wrong and, and how to correct it. He's, he's never on your back about it. and That's one reason, I guess, the men uh, like him so well. In civilian life, it's still rare for whites to take orders from Negroes, particularly in the South. Captain Mavruta said, there are southern boys in the Southern Larry's platoon that uh, possibly in, in civilian walks of life would resent working for a Negro. But when we're out in the field, uh, which is almost all the time, people go beyond the color barrier. The thing that they're worried about is that there's somebody is leading them who knows what he's doing and uh, who's going to get them through these tight situations. Arkansas. It doesn't seem to bother anyone to uh, take orders from me. No one in the field, they don't think anything about it. I've never heard a slang thrown at him because he is a Negro race. Damn sniper out there. You might keep your eyes peeled in that direction. Man. See if he fire again, and we, can, we might be able to get his location of both. We'd been moving toward a village, a cluster of peasant shacks or hooches. We were drawing sniper fire from the Viet Cong. This is what creates a bond between men, shared danger and dependence. And this. Yep, one, two, 
Here. Lieutenant Wilkinson, the young Negro officer, said, I'm out here with everybody else, cold and white, and just the other day, we had so many casualties. And nobody would say, well, we had one colored and we had five, five whites. I mean, they were all casualties. Hang on for a few more minutes. That chopper will be here. Hey, Sergeant John. Do a bow face with your element. Hold it up and wait till I move ahead of the column, and then we'll continue to move. You might have turned now. This trooper was a casualty of the sun. The air gets furnace hot and seems to scorch your lungs when you breathe. They just returned to this location. I'm sending them back up to police up those ruts. And, uh, well, we're going to remain down here. We've got this net back there. Uh, they should be re in your perimeter in about 0-3. Take one step up. Want to sit down? Keep it up. Can I drink water or something? Just take it. Okay. You feel better walking than you do somebody carrying you? Okay. Fine with you. Sir, no leave us, people. Go right over here. Sir, no leave us. Should be waiting for you. Right over there. Go down there and take a right. This is all by the 1-6 element and the Charlie Papa. Over. Uh, we got one PW uh, that we wounded, uh, and we're still uh, looking, uh, beating through the bush. We estimate there were three to five of them over. Hey, Doc, patch him up. The Doc who patched up the wounded enemy prisoner was a medic named Steve Vargo. It was also Vargo who shot him. Mm -hmm. This guy's a local force type, but he claims there were 30 NVA with him. And uh, when you people opened up on them, uh, they did it downhill. Uh, Captain Mavrudis is of Greek descent. Therefore, they gave him the radio code name Zorba. He didn't like it. Be careful, though. Uh, if there's 30 of them out there and you make contact, you'll have a fight on your hands, over. The sub-element well spread out and advanced on that trail uh, east to where you're directly above the, the, the last group of hooches there that's in that uh, little draw and I'll check those and then join you back up on the trail. While Larry would rather persuade his men than compel their obedience, he's no boy scout leader. Wilson, a tough sergeant himself, said of Larry, He doesn't particularly talk a lot, but he says a lot. And he goes back to this, just a few key words. Example, he'll say, Gentlemen, why do you cause yourself undue harassment? The holes must be dug deeper. Why didn't you do it the first time? But <laughs> well, he, he can be just as rough as he has to be. If a man screw up, it's not going to hurt him for you to chew him out. Let him know he's doing uh, things wrong. All you have to do is suggest the improvement in the weakness, and usually uh, the individual will comply. Everybody is willing to do what uh, is right because it might save somebody's life. The trails are narrow, often no more than a foot wide, and covered overhead by jungle brush. 
Rarely could we see more than a few yards in any direction. There are many forks and the trails turn abruptly. That's why the point man, the trooper at the head of the column, must be exceptionally alert. They told me the point man had better be alive or he'll be dead. Our point man killed this young Viet Cong. Someone had placed a cigarette between his lips. This, I was told, had become a unit tradition. Until now, there's been a belief Negro soldiers lacked courage. Lieutenant Unger said. On the subject of the courage of the Negro soldier, there's, there's been a lot written that they did not measure up to the courage commonly found in the white soldier. I've seen uh, quite a number of situations where both white and Negro had a chance to uh, display courage and had a chance to uh, display cowardice. And I think you get just as many white cowards as you get black cowards, and you get just as many black heroes as you get white heroes. Frequently, but not always, the peasant hooches are burned. The rationale? Destroy the enemy's home. Farm animals are slaughtered. The rationale? Deny the enemy food. Definition of enemy. Anyone out there but us. When he left the point over there, he was, they spotted him coming across, but he was too close on the fire. That's the reason why I immediately take the second squad and try to cut him off here. But then the tracks that we found in the stream indicate that there was somebody going down this way in the stream. So maybe there's three of them. We'll find it. Being a platoon sergeant, uh, when you're moving, you have an opportunity to observe each man. And you can tell right away, I can, by watching each one of them close, I can tell if he's normal. And if he's a little bit on the shaky side, I pull him off. Well, he shouldn't be in the, in the spot of the column that he is. He should be pulled back a little bit. If he's a little bit shaky that day, yeah, then I'll pull him back, put him in the rear of the column behind me. Officers above Larry and the men beneath him have seen him under fire. There is no more severe test of a man. At such a time, buried racial antagonisms might surface. I was anxious to learn what his officers and men thought of Larry under fire. Tell Pennington to bring his fire team on over here. He's never lost his cool, and I, I don't think he ever will. And, uh, the troops know that uh, no matter what the situation is, uh, he'll come through and he'll get them uh, uh, out of a tight spot in such a way that uh, the people won't get hurt unnecessarily. two Charlies trapped in caves. The troops call them spider holes. Come out, come out. What 
when we are receiving fire, well, Sergeant Larry, he, he's right up pumping lead along with the rest of us and giving us orders, and, well, he ain't gonna stand back in the rear and just d direct the fire. bunch up on it at one time. Okay, machine gun, move up. Right over here. Watch it, grenade. Watch it, grenade, grenade, grenade. Get down, get down, get down. Hey, Sam. Yeah, okay, drop down a little further over there. The machine gun's gonna stay in play. Stay down there around the CP and guard the CP. Try to toss it right in there. Don't expose yourself too long. Get all the way down. Grenade, Grenade hit the ground. All right, that was a good one. That one was dead in there. Hey, machine gun, pull back. Hey, sir, Stratmore came all up in there where you are. If it doesn't go, go in that hole. Grenade. And hey, don't throw any more grenades in there. That's enough to kill a damn horse. My feelings became mixed. There'd been a lot of us against only two of them. But when your life is at stake, you want the odds in your favor. Still, they were dead, and unknown people in some unknown village would weep. During the firefight, I learned a lieutenant who'd loaned me his hammock only three nights before had been severely wounded in another fight about a thousand yards away. Time after time, they tried to get helicopters in to remove him. He lay for six hours under the broiling sun on a jungle trail and then died. There's a teaching point. Make sure the weapon is unloaded. Eventually, the enemy weapons become the property of the troopers who killed them, if the troopers want them. Shortly after the firefight, a young North Vietnamese prisoner was brought in. He'd been taught to believe he'd be killed and beheaded. Check him out and see if he's got a weapon on Oh, I'm sorry. I noticed I'd begun to look at Negro soldiers and not even see their color. I checked this idea with Arkansas. You look at them and they're just a... Another guy out there, a guy that you can bum a cigarette off of if you're out, or get a drink of water if you're out, or a can of food. Everything is share and share alike. Arkansas grew up where Negroes must drink from separate fountains. Today, he drinks from the same canteen cup with them. I wondered how the folks back home would feel about that. Most of them would think it's the most terrible thing in the world, you know. They come over here and spend a couple of months, they'd learn it too. Hard way. Hawkins from Chicago. After you're with him so long, you're not looking at a man's color. You're looking at his intention and his job and what he's doing. You look over there and say, well, that man's picking up a shovel. You don't say that black man's picking up a shovel. You don't say, hey, colored sergeant, come here. Or, hey, colored sergeant, can I talk to you?
this old man, bound and hunkered in the rain, claimed the hooch some of us stayed in was his. Maybe it was. This kind of life would seem to have little to recommend it. Yet, three times as many Negroes re-enlist as whites. Sergeant Larry said, well, One of the things that uh, make the Army attractive to me is that being a Negro, uh, I think I'm given every opportunity to uh, develop myself or show what uh, skill I have uh, to the max. I'm given every opportunity to, to prove beyond any uh, doubt in anybody's mind that I'm a man and I can perform. I think this is a major thing that attract a lot of us. There's no racial barrier of any sort here. The men spend a month, sometimes two months, in the field. Then they pull back to the base camp for a short break. They call it a stand down. Captain Mavrudis had given considerable thought to why so many Negroes make the Army a career. The Army is one of the few places in our society where, where a Negro is not ostracized, is not looked down upon. It's a different uh, society within itself. Uh, whereas back in civilian life, a man does not associate with, on a 24-hour day basis, with the people that he works with. In the service, the the people that you work with on a daily basis are also the people that you socialize with day in and day out. Nowhere in America have I seen Negroes and whites as free, open, and uninhibited in their associations. I saw no eyes clouded with resentment. Arkansas. Well, ever we're on a stand down, the colored and the white boys would go over to a EM club, drink our beer together. I sit down, light up a cigarette, and one of them come over, take it out of your mouth and go to puff notes. You know, you don't think nothing about it except give me back my cigarettes, you damn fool. <laughs> It's a tradition with the men on stand down to throw all the officers and the senior non-commissioned officers into the ocean. A medical officer told me the salt water helps cure the men's jungle rot. It's the iodine. Officer, Lieutenant Wilkinson had some interesting thoughts on the Army as a career. The advantages for a young Negro as an officer in the Army, he has a status. He has a status. You go back to the civilian world, a Negro officer automatically has a status. Because most people back there, especially Negroes, they look up to a Negro officer because they have not seen that many in the past. And the more they see now, they, they look at him as, as if he's really done something. Remarkably short time, the deep lines of weariness were fading from their faces. It's one thing to be friends in the field, another to be friends in the rear areas. Captain Mavruda said, When they come back on stand down, they do uh, tend to go back to groups of uh, Negroes and whites. I think part of it is that, you know, after being with uh, another individual in the same foxhole for night after night for possibly as long as a month or a month and a half. 
and they just want to get a little variety. I don't think that uh, the groups are formed on the basis of color. I think they're formed on the basis of mutual interest. Now, this is one six, so Roger, I'm going to move on over just a little more. There's two more hooches, uh, and then uh, that should wrap it up. Uh, they're pretty well scattered about here, and we're going to turn around as soon as we check these other two hooches over here. Now, you can probably support us from where you are. Uh, just remain in position, and uh, we'll join you there, Ro. Your, is your location still uh, right 2.2 down 4.1 over? Uh, this is one six, uh, negative. This is six, Roger. We'll put fires uh, at the base of the hill. Uh, in that stream bed, uh, you might be able to adjust by noise, though. Uh, this is 1-6, uh, Roger. I think so, too. Either that or uh, dirt mounds. It could be dirt mounds stacked up. That's what it appears to be with you. And they have the shape of it. There were peasant hooches and farm animals in that area. I heard no effort made to keep the artillery fire away from them. Most hooches have caves dug under the floor. Peasants and the Viet Cong hide in them during attacks. Sergeant Wilson had noticed that when the tension ends, a peculiar thing happens. When the situation has relaxed, the Negro soldier tends to gather together with more people and more enthusiasm than any other group in the Army. The Negro tends to get louder, quicker, and faster, and sustain it until somebody comes by and breaks it up. Charlie can hear it if he's close, and if he hears it, He's got a group to fire at instead of just one man. The men are always behind enemy lines. From the moment they jump off a helicopter, they're surrounded. Everything, food, ammunition, clothing, must be flown into them. The dead and wounded are flown out. An effort is made to fly in hot chow every sixth day. In the month we were with them, they got hot chow once. On such resupply days, they get mail, newspapers, which might remind them of the race riots in the States. I talked at length with Larry about the race riots. He said, I don't understand it. I'd ask both, uh, my race and the white. How can somebody feel the way to do? I, I'd see all the stuff on television as, what the devil is this? And today, I, I still can't believe it. And if I could find a way to answer my own question, and I think I would be better off. But right now, uh, I'm confused, and I'm sure a lot of other people are confused. Because I refuse to believe that, that people just can't live together. The young Negro officer, Lieutenant Wilkinson. Some of these people believe just because they get out there and demonstrate and tear this city up and burn this city down that somebody's going to make an everlasting rule and say, well, okay, this is it. Everybody's the same and the whole problem's solved just by saying those couple of words, but it's not going to happen like that. But they're trying to skip over this so fast that instead of progressing forward, you may be going backwards. Larry is a Negro who is a leader. I wanted his thoughts on a Negro leader in the States, Stokely Carmichael. This guy encourages the people to dodge the draft, but what he's saying is that he wants them to dodge being America. He wants them to shirk the responsibility that goes along with being an American citizen. And when I read something like that, the first question that pop in my mind is that this guy doesn't believe in I'm an American citizen. and. Uh, he doesn't want to accept the responsibility that goes along with it. If one American is going to have to fight here, then it should be all Americans. I don't think you can say, well, you're going to have to go to Vietnam and fight because you're white. Or you won't have to go because you're colored. A 
I talked with Wilkinson and Larry, both Negro soldiers, about the concept of black power. These people that are advocating black power are trying to get there in a hurry. And uh, while they're getting there, they don't care whether or not they step on your face. I don't think there's such thing as black power or white power. Uh, this one-sided thing of black power versus white power, it's nonsense. I told Larry that in the States today, he would be called an Uncle Tom. Those that would call me an Uncle Tom, uh, I feel sorry for them. It wouldn't bother me one bit if, if somebody called me Uncle Tom because I'd just say it, it's just another stupid comment from somebody who's narrow-minded. I told him there was some concern that Negro veterans might return, join militant groups, use their guerrilla training, perhaps become snipers. I don't believe that one of these boys could go back and get discharged and, and pick up a sniper weapon and join a mob. I don't believe that he's small-minded enough to go back and utilize this against anyone. No man goes through a war unchanged. Its sights and sounds are seared into his memory. Life is reduced to its most fundamental values. The true is rapidly sifted from the false. Captain Mavrud has talked about the war's effect on the future attitudes of some white soldiers. I think the people who were in the group that really discriminated, uh, these people who come over here and really see that uh, the Negro is not everything that uh, their social group uh, said they were, and they'll know that they're not because they've uh, fought alongside with them, and their life, in many cases, was in the Negro's hands and vice versa they'll be able to go back to that same social group and tell them that uh, you can feed your life and your bias from Natal Doomsday, but I know better. We had no political scientist, psychologist, or urban affairs experts in our platoon. But they spoke with unassailable authority because they had lived what they were talking about. Hawkins from Chicago found himself imagining a race riot in which he might look up and see Sergeant Larry. If the case ever arises, and I look across, and I see Sergeant Larry, he would probably say something like, Hawkins, I never dreamed that someone like you could serve under me in, a, in Vietnam or could actually come back and do something like this. I'd probably cry. I would expect him to draw back and hit me as hard as he could I would get up and walk away. That's, that's how much I feel towards the man. And I say man, not the colored man. I would feel like a dog. I pray to God this never happens. And Larry imagined the feelings of a Negro veteran if he should become a sniper in a race riot. I'm sure if he was standing in that mob or firing at somebody and he had to face one of the the people he faced while he was in the army, he'd probably throw his weapon down and run and hide his face. Finally, some thoughts from a southern white boy who grew up in a segregated society, Arkansas. After I've gone through what I have over here, if a, a white man tried to get me riled up against the Negro, maybe go through a, a riot demonstration or something more, I think I'd just get mad enough to shoot him, period, and be done with it. This is Lava Roger. If I go up to where you are, I'll be... Uh and I want to try to flank them. Uh, that's why I'm asking you what direction you're firing in. It sounds to me like you're firing east, though. Well, what direction are you firing in? Uh, I know where the action is. I can hear it, but I want to know what direction you're firing in. I'll come in out of, out of flank, over. Well, what direction are you firing in? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where you're firing in. A Company was in deep trouble, penned down by heavy fire from North Vietnamese regulars. Our outfit, C Company, Charlie Company, was trying to relieve them. The 
battle came at the height of a typhoon. It rained 14 and a half inches in 24 hours. The men fought most of that time. Fear is a human instinct, not a racial one. Lieutenant Unger knows it. You say to a man, there's an enemy machine gun down there, let's go get it. And his heart's going to drop into his stomach, and his throat's going to start to tighten up. I don't care whether he's white, black, blue, red, or green, he's going to be afraid. From the siege of Troy until now, the same thing has kept soldiers going. Arkansas said it. Oh, no, it don't seem to bother me, being shot at. I just got it in my mind, hell, I'm not gonna get hurt, so... I ain't gonna get killed, so hell, drive on. This is Rob. I think I'm there now, but I'm going to try to link up with him. Uh, break. Maverick Bravo. Maverick, but I'm trying to find Maverick and try to get things consolidated. Contact was made with a survivor from A Company. He was wounded, but walking.
Finally, when the time allowed, there was a memorial service for the dead. Some may feel that our society, through the war in Vietnam, is making a terrible demand of the Negro in exchange for accepting him as a man, a human being. But Sergeant Larry feels a debt to the Army. As a career man in the Army, I have actually too much of military experience to get out. I think I'd be wasting it. I think I would hurt the Army. I think that they can use my experience in the Army. And the younger people that are going to come in, I think they need somebody to help them. Our history books have taken little notice of the Negro soldier. How do the troops of this war, black and white, want its history written? Captain Mavrudis. You can't divide them as a group. It's the man. It's not the color. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the credit uh, for anything that happens in this war, no matter what the outcome is, belongs to both the white and Negro. Wilkinson, the young Negro officer, told how he would want a child of his to question him about the war. I would want my child to ask me the role of the American soldier in Vietnam. But as to breaking it down to say, well, we have a total of good deeds by uh, colored soldiers this high, and we have a, a stack of good deeds by white soldiers this high, I mean, no, I don't, I don't think it would come out that way. The American Army is fully a generation ahead of the American public in its handling of the races. What the Army has achieved is what America, despite bigots, Negro and white, hopes someday to achieve. The elimination of race as a factor in human existence. The Army has achieved this to such an extent that the men I was with had difficulty in reorganizing their thoughts to match mine and answer questions on a subject they've stopped thinking of. Captain Mavrudis. The thing that is hard for me to convey is that we don't feel that way in the service. That feeling doesn't exist in the, in the Army. We're all soldiers, and the only color we know is the khaki and the green. The color of the mud and the color of the blood is all the same. Five days after we left him, Captain Anthony Mavrudis who believed the color of the mud and the color of the blood is the same, was killed by an exploding landmine.